So this is about uh, the WIPO Arbitration and Mediation Centre, which deals with intellectual property disputes between private parties by offering certain alternative res dispute resolution procedures uh, to enable them to settle their disputes once and for all internationally, actually. For, uh, and um, it's a relatively recent activity of the organisation, you know, starting up about 20 years ago or so. Uh, and um, the principal area of activity that we have is uh, cyber squatting or internet domain name cases. So these are cases where uh, a trademark owner is alleging that someone has registered a domain name that is either the same as or confusingly similar to uh, the trademark. Uh, and obviously in the domain name space, you have great opportunity for that because uh, there are now 1,200 uh, uh, generic top-level domains in operation. You know, so for a company watching, surveying uh, its what's happening to its brand in those space, uh, the space is increasing. It's 1,200 now, and secondly, uh, you know, there there is endless variety that you can put, you know, you can put an adjective before the name, you can put, a, you know, more or less flattering, you can, uh, you can uh, alter the typing slightly, you can, uh, there are endless ways in which you can uh, create a domain name registration that is uh, similar, confusingly similar to a mark. And what we see in that area is that the number of cases increases, 10% increase 2016 compared to 2015, we're dealing, we're talking about 3,000 cases. We're talking about a um, uh, cases in which now the, the so-called new GTLDs, so these are not .com, .org, you know, the old GLT, TLDs, but the new ones like .games, .shop, .stream, they now, now account for 16% of the caseload that we receive. Uh, it's very international, as one would expect the, if with the internet, international set of procedures. Uh, so in 2016, uh, they uh, our cases, domain name cases, involve parties from 109 countries. Um, the top uh, origin of filings was the US, followed by France, Germany, UK, Switzerland. Uh, we give you figures on that. Uh, and we also give you figures on the uh, various areas of activity, um, commercial activities, the highest being banking and finance, followed by fashion, followed by heavy industry and so on. Um, just a final word then, we also do through the Arbitration Mediation Centre offer procedures for not for domain name disputes but general intellectual property disputes between two parties and I must say it's very pleasing to see that there, well I shouldn't be saying it's pleasing to see a lot more disputes, but um, a lot, it's pleasing to see a lot more disputes passing through our um, centre. Uh, so some 60 mediation and arbitration cases last year. And these can range from 20,000 euros to um, literally hundreds of millions of dollars um, in the value in dispute. Uh, so uh, there we are. Uh, Eric, do you want to add anything? I think that's it, Director. I think the figures are up on both counts, domain in disputes and arbitration and mediations about other types of IP disputes. And uh, with further growth of the domain name system, we expect to see those numbers continue to rise. And is it the, the main reason for cyber spotting is, is, is to get money from the uh, That's one. <coughs> so, your uh, uh, principal motivation may be to divert, tr divert traffic to your website. So, someone looking for X mark, and there is a slight variation on it. You might get, you might be coming up in the research in the search results, and and so they're it, diverting traffic, uh, diverting eyeballs is number one. Uh, number two is yes, there are certain people who register something, jump in and register a domain name, and then will arbitrage it, in, that is, they will offer it to the true owner, if I may say, um, at a price which is less than what it would cost them to do the domain name resolution. <coughs> yeah, so you could register a domain name, 
which is confusingly similar to uh, or the same as a trademark. And then you could say, well, we'll you know, it costs you maybe $10 to register it, and we'll sell it to you for 2000 which is less than the government company would have to pay in legal fees to go through <coughs> a dispute settlement procedure. Now, of course, a lot of companies are very uh, careful not to get involved in, in you know, uh, feeding that sort of activity. <coughs> What's happening to the 3,000 cases that are fired? Are yeah. they resolved? Or mm -hmm. who, who's yeah. resolving them? Uh, mm -hmm. What's, so, the, what's the connection between the 3,000 cases and the 60 mediations? <coughs> well, obviously, uh, <coughs> excuse me, in the, in the <coughs> case of domain name cases, uh, you are dealing with a domain name registration which is extremely easy to get. You know, you can go online and get it in three seconds. Uh, and it, it's, it's very cheap, you know, $10 is... is, is as much as you would have to pay, depending on which server, which provider you're using. Uh, so uh, there is a potential for creating mischief there. Uh, and these, there's no screening procedure. There's no one that looks at, there's no authority that looks at a domain name registration and says, oh, that's confusingly similar to a, a trademark. And all of that, uh, you know, uh, results from the desire in the early days of the internet to ensure that regulatory procedures did not slow down this massive embracing of the internet and growth of the internet and the possibility of people to go online, register a domain name for a conference, an event, whatever it might be, very easily. Uh, and this procedure enables you to cease that, um, that activity, so they're all resolved. Uh, some of them are resolved in favour of the domain name applicant. Most of them are resolved in favour of the trademark owner. And that's not surprising because what we're dealing with is uh, uh, allegedly bad faith registration of a domain name. Uh, so uh, it's cyber scoring. <coughs> you know. So who is resolving them? Sorry, so we have a list of panellists. Uh, and the arbitration centre appoints a panellist. Um, usually it's possible to have three panellists, you know, if the parties choose. Uh, and our panellists, uh, uh, we had, um, we used panellists from how many countries there? Uh, 47 countries. 47 countries last year. Last year, excuse me, five panellists. But 60 panels were established for 3,000 No, 60, cases. so that's different. So no, 3,000 okay. cases, first category. Second category is you and I have a dispute about copyright. You know, um, I claim that you have uh, plagiarized my, you know, uh, article or book or whatever it might be. Or you and I have a dispute about uh, patents. Uh, so uh, you claim that I am using your technology, which is patented. Uh, so it's all possible intellectual property disputes, and they generally are a you know much more heavy. Uh, substance okay. that's involved. The first class mm -hmm. is just this, you know. But it's still a panelist who, who resolves these 3,000 cases. Uh, absolutely, always, yeah. Always one who or here three. here listens to both sides and then says this is it. Online procedure. Online so procedure. So all, all yeah, filings online. On the domain name side. On the domain name side, could, yeah. Could you remind us what happened when the, you make a decision against one of the parties and this party has to close, to change the name, and what is the level of compliance? Okay, so, decisions? so, and I have yeah, some, sure. <laughs> opportunity. And do you have an estimation on the law of, of law, economic loss of, uh, that suffer trademarks because of these situations, this confusion? Or mm. Mm. Uh, well, look, uh, on the first, the system works uh, on a contractual basis, uh, namely that when a domain name registrar, that's someone who can register a domain name for you, is authorised to do so by ICANN, the Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers, um, they agree that they will abide by the results of the what's called the Uniform Dispute Resolution Procedure. And that's this. So they agree that they will implement the results. And 
When you apply for a domain name, you also agree that you will submit to a procedure that is brought under the UDRP, the Uniform Dispute Resolution Procedure. So, if I, uh, if you sue me uh, under that, claiming that I've cyber squatted your, you know, your trademark, uh, I am obliged to submit to the procedure, even though some don't bother putting in defences, uh, and the result will be either that I win and there's no cyber squatting, it's, it's judged, or uh, the registration is cancelled, or it is transferred to the winning party. Uh, there, these are the possibilities. There are no damages. Uh, and on the second uh, question, uh, we don't have any such estimate, but what we do know is that for a company that has a brand, of course, the internet and the domain name space is a, you know, it's a hazardous uh, area for them. So they have to, uh, uh, you know, watch what might be happening to their brand, and companies will adopt different attitudes. Some will try to stop any possible infringement. That typically might be the case of a of a uh, a high-end uh, fashion or haute couture uh, company which doesn't want its reputation in any way diminished on the internet. And others might say, well, we're just going to be interested in the dot-com area because that's where you know, most space is happening and, and so on. So it's, it's their strategy to determine how they protect their brand. But uh, do we know the way most of the cybersquatting of origin of the respondents that are using the cases? Mm, we do, yes. We, we, we um, at least, of course, we maintain statistics about who are the respondents uh, in the WIPO cases. Um, a separate question is whether that is representative of the picture of cyber squatting as a whole, but that is probably a, a reasonably fair measure of that. Uh, we publish, it's actually Annex 2 of the press release, we publish uh, the statistics both on the complainant side, this is the trademark filing side, as well as the respondent side, that is those who register the domain names that are being objected against. Um, and we see, as the Director General mentioned, the United States on the complainant side in position number one, but we also see the United States still today in position one uh, among respondents, that is those registrants who are being contested. Um, however, um, we see the China, um, which has come up through the ranks uh, over the years of our statistics, being close by in second position among respondents, and then it's followed by the United Kingdom, Turkey, Australia, France, India, etc. You'll see the, the listing quite a bit. He quite stopped, he said, etc., when after India it was Netherlands. Because <laughs> <laughs> he's Dutch. <laughs> <laughs> Because it's a big company with lots of brands. It's a big company with lots of brands. And, and a separate question, and we are not sure whether that specifically relates to Philip Morris, is the relationship between, of course, uh, counterfeiting and filing, trademark owners filing this type of case uh, with WIPO against so called service quarters. Mm -hmm. um, I would not presume, I have not done, we have not done the specific statistics on these many Philip Morris cases. But I would not be surprised if you see a fairly uh, uh, typical incidence of allegations of cyber of, of counterfeiting against the respondents, the registrants of those domain names in those cases. Mm -hmm. So that may explain as well. Yeah. Um, do you want to Sorry. 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 Yeah. Um, do you know what percentage of the 3,000 cases that come to your attention are of the total cyber squatting cases? Or are there other ways of resolving the disputes without involving the white I think your question goes not so much to what's the total number of UDIP cases coming to WIPO, which is about 60%, as the Director General mentioned. Uh, your question goes to how many cyber squatting cases actually make it into a formal complaint under this UDIP system. Is that correct? How many, in other words, how many domain name cases, how many infringements, cyber cases of cyber squatting are not even seen in this system? Yes. Right. Well, that is basically like asking us, could you please measure the tip of the iceberg by, you know, by comparison to the rest of it? 
Um, and <laughs> sorry for the, the easy metaphor, but we do not know that. It's an interesting statistic to make. I think the best way to, to understand that it, is, that it is just merely the tip of the iceberg is to know that in this system, and even more so, of course, in court litigation, it is the treatment owner that has to, A, prepare the case, spot the case, find the case, mm. observe it, the incidence of cyber squatting, B, make the case, write the case, C, file it, and D, pay the fee. And so it's, it is quite uh, uh, um, uh, reasonable to assume that, uh, that there are extremely high numbers of cyber squatting behind those cases that trademark owners have decided to invest their enforcement budgets into. Mm. How much does it cost? What's the fee? The standard fee for up to five domain names in one case uh, for a single member panel, which is 95% or more of all cases, a uh, decision is uh, $1,500. And that fee has stayed... Not Swiss francs? 1500 US dollars, and that has stayed uh, stable over the uh, since the inception of this system, uh, because we need to keep this a low threshold system uh, by comparison to the alternative of court litigation. Any more questions? Um, Besides so um, John, has there been any evidence from uh, the cases the arbitrators have looked at? of intentional cyber squatting for COVID damage of a brand. The branding de facto to undermine a, a brand. Yes, there's lots of cases in which there are very rude words before a brand. Okay, so, um, you know, it might be, for example, because I give you an example only because it happened to be a case. Uh, Walmart, and before that might be a rude word. No. Dot com. No. Uh, that was. We won't ask you to be specific. No. <laughs> so that. Uh, so if that's what you mean, yes, that goes on, um, which is complex. Mm. No, I was thinking if the evidence found that it was uh, uh, structured uh, uh, by the competition to undermine. The, uh, the competitive brand. In other words, that, that, that is a strategy behind using cyber squatting to undermine your competition. I, I, I hope uh, people don't get ideas from your smart, smart question here, but, <laughs> but uh, it, it doesn't seem to be uh, uh, the most logical uh, presumption, I think, because um, it would be difficult for such a, for example, competitor to remain anonymous in this exercise. Sooner or later, one would think yeah. that a case comes filed against such a competitor and I think the public relations or, or even legal Good consequences point. of that Good point. bill in comparison to to the yeah. to any gains but that no, I would get. No evidence has come up. Yeah. We don't have any evidence we, and you yeah. should also realize that there are 330 million domain and registrations in the world. Um, so to try to, about 330 million which includes not only the GTLDs, the generic top level domains, the international domains mentioned by the Director General. But it also includes uh, a component of about, I believe today, about one third of that, which are national domains. And so for any dot party, de. Dot de for Germany, for example. So, so for any party to, to believe that it could really start to make a, a material difference in, in harming reputation of a competitor on such an ocean of domain names, I think is a, is, is a rather tall ambition. Can I, can I follow up on that? I mean, uh, the, um I was working on the other subject, before, so I, I didn't hear everything. But the um, what do you what information do you have about a systemic sort of approach to cyber spotting or not? I mean, who who is could it be? Uh, could there be sort of repeat offenders that are behind this? And um, uh, you know, I mean, even state actors potentially. I mean. The answer to the could it be is, of course, yes. You know, <laughs> right. So, yeah, uh, well, what is your evidence? Uh, uh, yeah. what, what, what is, what we is don't it? have any evidence to suggest this is an area that attracts state you know, activity or at attention. Um, and, uh, well, there are some serial respondents, let's say. So, the, the, what do we know about them? Well, the typical case of cyber squatting has evolved from. Uh, you know, a rather more incidental type of registration 
made uh, in order to, as the Director General mentioned, as one of the scenarios, sell back for a ransom in a sense at a premium the domain name to the third party trademark owner. That's the classic scenario, in essence, that got the UWP system led by the Director General in 1999 started. Um, uh, the evolution of the, of the cases that we see at WIPO is, 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 of course, the evolution of the domain name system as a whole. And what you see here is that professional parties have, have really uh, started to dominate the registration picture. These are the so-called domainers, using a technical term here. A domainer is not synonymous to a cyber squatter. I, I, I think we should say that very clearly. Um, but a domainer is, is an entity, often companies, individuals behind them, that use rather sophisticated technologies and techniques in order to monetize as many domain names as possible. And the possibility, of course, exists, uh, and is quite likely, that among those huge portfolios, which can run into the thousands or hundreds of thousands, held by one entity, uh, names will be scooped up by those uh, domainers that are actually infringing uh, on uh, third-party trademark rights. So, um, yes, there is definitely a systemic pattern to how domain names are being registered. And with that, by implication, comes a more systemic uh, consequence in terms of cyber squatting in the cases that we see. And they might, for example, be guessing what uh, companies uh -huh. are going to do in the future, what films might be coming out in the future, what this, what that. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. And perhaps one other thing to add to what Eric has just said is that we do have a search engine for cases on our website here, and you may wish to search certain terms or names of political figures on that. Can I, can I, sorry, can I just follow that up? Um, the, what, about, what do you know about the geographic origin of the, of the people that may be <coughs> responsible for this cyber body? And second question, you mentioned a bit about ransom. Um, <coughs> this, in the sort of hostage taking uh, scenario, um, hostage takers tend to take uh, hostages from countries that pay ransom. So in other words, <laughs> is, is, is Philip Morris uh, a, a repeat uh, uh, target? <coughs> our other companies, are they saying, OK, we'd rather not deal with this, and we'll just pay, pay off? I, I don't think it's a question yeah. of, of a, yeah. We can't give a definite answer to that. I mean, okay. uh, the indication would be that Philip Morris is very Carefully guarding its crimes, yeah, from the cases. Yes, it, it has it has more to do, we presume, because of the nature of the problem. Sorry, it has more to do with trademark value than wherever that trademark is located, and so no trademark is really safe from this wherever it is located. And when you hear our director general here, uh, you know, indicate trends, for example, in patent filing or or especially under the Madrid system trademark filing. There is probably an indirect link between those developments and where the uh, cyber squatting activity and the filing complaints of the future may may shift to. And, so and, and, and just a final comment, maybe, is if you compare it to real property, you know, some people who are in the business of real property might be looking at sites around town mm -hmm. where they're expecting some activity. Mm -hmm. uh, and they might want to, uh, they might purchase plots in order to uh, be holding it when whoever it is that's planning something larger there is going to come, uh, have to come along and buy them out. So this is uh, an area in which there is some legitimate competitive positioning, but also illegitimate. Yeah. Just a short one, uh, just to be clear. Is the profit of the fees related to these cases part of the 380 million that you mentioned before, or is it separated? Uh, actually, it's the revenue that we derive, rather than profit, I would say, from uh, administering this service is part of the yeah. 380 million. So it's um, just patents? No, no, it's, it's uh, of the 380 million, 76% PCT. About um, uh, uh, 16 to 18 uh, percent uh, Madrid trademarks, and about one percent the Hague designs, and about one percent arbitration, a little bit less uh, than that. So, yeah, those are round figures.